Today's message, we go down in history as a legacy message. It will, because of the dealings of God Almighty with me, and because I'm giving you one of the best that I've received from him. The teachings and the trainings over the years that have shaped my life and have helped me that no matter what assignment he gives to me, it will always show up with abundant provision. This morning we are going to continue, or is it afternoon already? We are going to continue where we stopped last Sunday with the message, the difference between the God-driven church and the need-driven church. The subtitle for today's message is, be careful what you do with your harvest. Say that to your neighbor, be careful what you do with your harvest. This message will make some and break others. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ, when Simeon got into the temple, he held them in his hand and told the mother and everyone who cared to listen, this child is set up for the rising and falling of many people in Israel. May you rise in the name of Jesus Christ. You're going to turn your Bible with me to three texts of scripture. I'm giving you my best things that I knew, that I understood, what my eyes have seen, my ears have heard, and my hands have handled, the trainings I've received that have catapulted me from obscurity into prominence. That's not pride. Any taru beko le moaro to she ton to call ya la ruru. And I want you to be patient with me as I deliver this masterpiece of a legacy message. We are going to turn to three or four texts of scripture to contextualize the message itself. We are talking about the harvest, and I said, be careful what you do with your harvest. So I want to go first and foremost to the place and the time the Lord God Almighty promulgated the law of the harvest. Genesis 8, verse 20 to 22. It was a law promulgated by God, not for Christians, but for the human race. Because there was no church at that time, no Hindu, no Judaism, no Muslim, no religion. It was God and Noah, a man who found grace in the sight of God. And because of the disaster and the chaotic disorder that erupted in the world before the flood came, God Almighty initiated a new law. It's called the law of harvest that governs the universe. Genesis 8, 20 to 22. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again cause the ground for man's sake. Although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy everything as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. Tell your neighbor, the law is still on. Is as powerful as gravity. For as long as this earth remains, seed, 
time and harvest shall never cease. Let's look in the New Testament. For the New Testament version of the law of the harvest. I know several, but one example is enough. Galatians chapter 6, I'll read from verse 6 to 10. Galatians chapter 6, verse 6 to 10. It reads, and I quote, Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Pastors are not good to go and find barra with congregation. If they are teaching them accurately, they will not be dismayed. They will not be afraid. They will not lack any good thing. And when that happens, you don't need to put pressure. They will be the one looking for you like the Pelitites and Keritites and the Gittites were always there for David. But in Jeremiah it says, the pastors, of the shepherds have become brutish. They do not know God. Therefore, I will scatter the flock and take their flock away from them. When shepherds do their job, they don't need to go with begging bowl. Because people will know that there's grace that is working in the shepherd's life, that is working in their lives, like those in debt, those distressed, and those discontent became mighty men following David. So, Galatians 6, do not be deceived, verse 7, God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Seed, time, and harvest shall never cease. Whatever you sow, you go reap. <laughs> whatever you plant, you go harvest, oh. Whether na good o, whether na bad o, whatever you sow, you go reap. Whatever you sow, you na go reap. If we call, whatever you plant, you na go harvest o. Whether na good o, whether na bad o, whatever you sow, you go reap. Let's read. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap. Corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap. So there are two grounds to sow in. You can sow into your flesh or you can be led by the Holy Spirit in the way you handle your harvest. Because you have to harvest before you give. Do you understand me? It's not going to be real struggle if you have received a harvest it's not difficult to part with what part of the harvest do you understand that yes, uh, someone said but the barrel shed but the barrel yeah to the back if the hunter is going to think of the trouble he went through before catching a game he will not give to any other person he will consume it all by himself it depends on the type of animal he has caught. <laughs> if he catches a, a rat or rabbit, he can consume it, whether poisonous or delicious. But when you, you go to the hunting field and you are able to kill an elephant, nobody will beg you because, before you call your neighbors. That was what happened to Peter, James, and John when the boat began to sing, they beckoned to their partners whose boat was not used. They said, come partners, bring it in here. Do you understand me? If you sow into the flesh, if you allow yourself to be manipulated into giving, there will be no returns. If you sow into the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. But if you are led by the Holy Spirit and you sow into the Spirit, you will of the Spirit reap eternal life. God's kind of life. That's the way. Let's read up to verse 10. And let us not grow weary while doing good. Because when you are sowing, it's not easy. Especially when you are given to God that which costs you something. It's not easy. Let us not be weary while doing good. For in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. 
if we do not faint, if we do not lose heart, in due season we shall reap. And in the course of this message, if time permits, I will show you how the seasons can jump together. Many of you may not know this is my terrain. Do you understand me? This is my past law. This is the area God has really helped me and has graced me. And when I flow in this area, I'm not telling you what's happened to someone. I'm telling you what God has done in me, for me, through me, for others. And you will be partakers in the name of Jesus. Verse number 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, you know, you know, <laughs> you know what, what I, every time I see that scripture, I create the opportunities. You don't understand. I create the opportunities. Why do I say so? Because a generous man devises generous schemes, and it's by his generosity that he will stand. As we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith, to all include those who are not of the household of faith. Let us do good to all, especially. You can see your brother in need and who's drowning, and you are saying, let us pray together when you have something to help him. How can you say you love God when you don't love your brother? Let's see the process that the law of harvest takes. I've given you the promulgation of the law. I've showed you the New Testament version. What process does it take from the time of sowing to the time of reaping? (laughs) Mark chapter 4, verse 26 to 29. Mark 4, 26 to 29. It reads, and I quote, And he said, the kingdom of God... It's as if a man should scatter seed where? On the ground. ground. And should sleep, how? By night and rise by day. And the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. I don't think you are getting this. A farmer goes to sow. He spreads the seed on the ground and he goes to sleep in his house and to rise, sleep at night, rise by day, and the seed takes root and begins to sprout. The farmer does not know how, just as how many children do you have? Three, how many boys? Two, how many girls? One, when you were intimate with your wife, did you plant a son? Did you plant a woman? You do not know the way bones are formed in the womb of a woman who is with child. What you gave to her is a drop of liquid. How do eggs have bones and feathers and beak? You don't know how. So if you don't know how, what makes you the Lord of the harvest? Let's read. For the earth yields crops by itself. First the blade, then the head. After that, the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens immediately, he, the one who scattered the seed, puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. Who brought about the harvest? I can't hear you. <laughs> Please, even if I'm unable to finish this message today, I will continue another time. Learn this. Talking deep in your heart. No matter the increase that you receive, that comes to you by virtue of your expertise, talent, profession, career, business, trade, whatever it is, 
There is only one Lord of the harvest. His name is Jesus. Not you. I'm saying you don't have a right to do what you will with your harvest. And I'm talking from experience. Can I repeat myself? The harvest is not yours. It's the Lord's. And if you want to stay on the side of perpetual increase, you must constantly ask him what to do with the harvest. Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 and 38. Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 and 38. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful. The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Say that with me. I can't hear you. But the laborers, therefore, pray ye. I can't hear you. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into his harvest. Now, our conclusion with this message is talking about souls. That's how we conclude. So this, this applies to soul winning. Because thereafter in chapter 10, he called 12 of his disciples and made them apostles, empowered them, and sent them uh, to the lost sheep of Israel. So you will read immediately, he must be talking about soul winning. The harvest of souls belong to the Lord. If the harvest of souls belong to the Lord, how about the harvest of the souls? You didn't get it. If the harvest of the souls belong to the Lord, who do the souls belong to? Mm, you didn't get it. Once upon a time, you were in the valley of decision. You were not born again. God sent someone your way. You had the gospel. You yielded to the Lord. So you were part of the harvest in the field that was brought in. So if you are brought in as by the leading of the Lord of the harvest, you that are brought in, who owns you? The Lord. Who owns what you have? Lord. Well, let's not stop there. Let's go on. It does not apply only to the harvest of souls. It applies to all facets of life. Genesis chapter 2 verses 4 and 5. Genesis 2 verses 4 and 5. This is the history of the heavens. If you read it in KJV, it said this is the generation. This is the genealogy of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Before any plant of the field was in the earth. Can I hear amen? Amen. Before any plant of the field was in the earth. And before any herb of the field had grown. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth. And there was no man to till the ground. Do you understand this? There was no growth anywhere. Nothing was growing at this point in time. Because there was no responsible man God can trust with the harvest. He did not cause it to rain on the earth. Genesis chapter 2 verses 8 and 9. I want to show you, don't forget this so that you do not become ex-millionaire. Many people have crashed because they don't understand this. Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. The Lord God did what? Planted a garden eastward in Eden, and then he put the man whom he had formed. Why did he not just thrust him into the entire earth? He wanted to test him in little things because he can give him much. Because only he was faithful in little that will be given much. So he planted a garden to start testing him. To trust training him, okay? What happened when he planted the garden? And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow. It wasn't Adam that made it grow. And so whatever grows in that garden, who is the Lord of the harvest? 
the Lord made it grow. Every, that is every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden. And the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Need I go to how Adam fell, Yakata, with his wife? They are unfaithful in that which is least. The whole planet was theirs. The gold, the beryllium, the honest stone, everything was theirs. But one. Hey, I'm the Lord of the harvest. I've given you all this, but don't eat this. The day you eat it, in dying, you shall surely die. Did mankind pass the test? No. So they were thrust out of the garden of plenty and pleasure and abundance to now be sweating and be tilling in the ground. That's what happens to you when you become the Lord of the harvest. Let me go further. Genesis chapter 26, verse number 12. Genesis 26, verse number 12. Then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year what? What year? Verse 1 said there was a famine in the land beside the famine that was in the days of Abraham. Famine is not a new thing. Do you understand me? Inflation, depression, they are not new. But in the midst of inflation, you can compare your ground to produce. By your obedience to God. So Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year what? A hundredfold. Why? The Lord blessed him. It was the Lord of harvest that made it happen. The Lord blessed him. Not his expertise, not his network, not his net worth, not his wizardry at investment. The Lord blessed him. And what happened? Next verse, the man began. See, this is the trouble. The moment we begin to prosper, we hijack the process. So we return, we return to square one. The man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. For he had possessions of flocks, possessions of herds, and a great number of servants, so the Philistines envied him. I stand before God who joy the quick and the dead. Overnight today I saw one of my sons in the faith, and I will tell the person when we finish, let God be true and every man a liar. If it is false, almighty God knows. If it is true, almighty God knows. He was wearing a simple flowing in Agbara, and I said, where are you going? He said, sir, you won't believe it. They just told me to come and collect another check for two billion. I said, you have just started. Amen. But you can truncate the process. By becoming the Lord of the heavens yourself. Pastor Deboy is still alive. So if you want to lie against a man who is alive, you better lie in secret. God began to prosper my practice in a phenomenal way that what was coming was coming overwhelming. And suddenly, I thought the resources were mine. Land the hard way, what I'm giving to you free of charge now. I began to think, how can you pay this type of money as tight? I sized up the pastor. Won't this kill him? I remember very well the first time I brought an offering to my pastor for the convention and I brought it in in cash and he saw it and he wanted to pray for me. God is witness, both of us fell. Another force beyond us came in. Do you understand me? But you begin to think, you suddenly think you are the one in charge now. So I went to start pricing Rolls Royce. This was 1985. 
My wife is alive. Yes, this is the spec that I really like. And I began to look at houses in strategic places because the harvest was on the way. I was elated that nothing could stop it. And suddenly, everything vanished. Pastor is alive. I had to go and amend my ways and to humble myself before God, before he restore to me wasted opportunities. So I'm talking from what God has done in my life. I learned never to assume the harvest is mine. Because it is he who gives you power to get work in order for you to acquire everything you desire, in order for him to establish a covenant. Does God want you not to acquire? Oh, all those things will be freely added to you. But it's not because you are running after them. Lift your course 26. Those days I had seven ship load coming from Korea on the high sea. Morambong, Gozambong, Sans Dudok, I can name them. Everything was shuttered. I gave to pastor. We knew how much was coming in. But suddenly all I was acquiring and I was walking about, I saw that rose. This is why they even will bring rose stories to me. I would say, I don't want. Take, 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 take it, go. When you become strong and you say, Daddy, here is Rolls Royce, I'll pack it, I'll use it because there are no rolls to ride it on. Mm. Do you understand these things? Yes, Man, in those days, can I be honest with you? Yes, it would be about nine o'clock. I'll call British Caledonia Airways. When are you flying tonight? So we are going, I can tell you the name of the officers in BA. We are flying at 10.30 as I reserve a first class seat for me. And sometimes we'll be Swiss Air. And you say, what am I going to do? I'll be going to Switzerland to swim for the weekend. I wear slippers. And go to Switzerland and swim for the weekend and return home. You understand me? Because you don't know you are not the Lord of the harvest. I don't want it to happen to anyone close to me. Because I've gone that way before. I prayed in the Spirit. I prayed in the Holy Ghost. I prayed in understanding. Nothing happened. And I had a laughter from heaven. Ha, 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 ha. You are too full until you are empty. I can't feel you anymore. Let God be true and every man a liar. I know what I'm talking about. Genesis or Lifticus chapter 26. Lifticus 26, 3 to 5. Lifticus 26, 3 to 5. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and perform them, then I will give you rain in its season. The land, I will do what? I is the father of rain. Go read your Bible and discover it. I'll give you rain in its season. The land shall yield its produce. The trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your treasure shall last till the time of vintage. And the vintage shall last till the time of sowing. You shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land safely. Not only that, not only that, verses 9 and 10. If you will be accurate and you let him be the Lord and you are just a steward, verses 9 and 10. For I will look on you favorably and make you fruitful, multiply you and confirm my covenant with you. You shall eat the old harvest and clear out the old because of the new.
Believe me, I'm not sure you know that it can jam all the seasons. You know, he said, for as long as the earth remains, seed, time, and harvest shall never cease. But it can jam them that as you are sowing, you are reaping, and you are reaping, you are sowing, as you are sowing, you are reaping, and you don't know what time you are in because of avalanche of blessings coming your way. It can jam the seasons together, only waiting for you to be faithful. Amos chapter 9. Amos 9, 13. Are you there? Okay. Behold, the days are coming. Can I hear amen? amen. Can I tell you they are here? Yes. That as you hear this, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing today. Yes. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman... What is the role of the plowman? To clear the ground in order to start sowing. When the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of graves, him who sows seeds. Do you understand me? They will just be, they will be running into each other. The cycles will jam. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. You will not labor for another person to eat. In the name of Jesus Christ. You will be in charge of your own time. You wake up when you choose. You sleep when you choose. You determine where you want to go and where you don't want to go. And you are not beholden unto anyone except God Almighty. Because it becomes your source and the cycles are jamming all around you. See, if anyone thought last week, let me hold what I have till now. We'll see what will happen next Sunday. It's been paid. Settled. Because God is not waiting for you. He just wants to include you. Yes. Let's go on. John chapter 4, is it the Lord of the harvest or not? You can be thinking in four months, what I'm expecting will come. And I say, no, I'm bringing it now. That four months is too far away for him. <laughs> John chapter 4, 27. John 4, 27. And at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. You remember the woman of Samaria? Yet no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot, went away into the city and said to the man, come and see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They then went out of the city and came to him. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. Like I was coming this morning, my daughter said, can I pack your breakfast? You have not eaten. I said, <laughs> when I get to church, I'll drink something before I preach. Just leave food. Leave food out of it now. I'm just going for this. Rabbi, eat. He said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God shall man live by. I have meat that you do not know of. Therefore, the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat. Who eats anything? <laughs> Jesus said to them, my food. What is my food? I can, this, is, this is the, this is the uh, what, what do you lawyers call it? This is the, uh, what does IMF call it? Uh, conditionalities. Uh, these are the uh, attached laws to the law of harvest. <laughs> this one makes the law of harvest work in your favor. My meat is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. When you are in the epicenter of God's will, harvest time for others will not be the same for you. They will wait till, the, till winter, summer, spring, and what have you. But they will ask you to lift up your eyes and see the field. Here we go. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? <laughs> How many months before the harvest will come in? 
Do you not say that there are still four months and then comes there? Behold, I said to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. Everybody is waiting for four months. But it will lift up your eyes. It will give you incredible uh, creative ingenuity that will shorten the process. Amen. At a critical point in the course of building this other, we are behind by 750 million. I told you the story here, didn't I? And I came to church and said, please, let's all rally around and do our best. We gave our best. It came to 30 million. And I would say, oh, God, you said this is faith project. Almighty God, you said it will not stop from the day it starts till it finishes. What will I do? I can't overburden these people. Help me. I trust you. You show up. God come for your sake, change governmental policy. For your sake, you move. I was sitting at home when my bankers who did some investment for me in the past came in and said, "Um, the investment we did for you is time for rollover. Shall we roll it over? I said, roll what over? How much do I have? They mentioned the figure. That week, central bank raised dollar from 360 to 560. And when they rolled, instead of rolling over, when they multiplied, it was just a little more than what we needed. I cleared it up and we paid. And over the next week, it went back to 360. Who is the Lord of harvest? Who shortened the process? Who made that provision? Can he do it for you? He can change. I called the CBN governor. I said, I don't know what you are doing there, but this one, you did well. You did well. You did very, very well. More grace to your elbows. <laughs> Do you not say, go back to verse 35. <laughs> I love. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows, somebody has sowed the seed, and he who reaps may rejoice together. I'm sowing this morning, you are going to reap. But we are going to rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows, and another reaps. I love this. And many people will never attain this in all their career because of their, of their, uh, what do you call it? Self will. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. You don't understand. Others will finish. And your better one will say to the genuine you see. Okay, if you don't believe it's a lot of harvest, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. I, I can't hear you. Who is that? I planted Apollos water. I planted Apollos water. Neither of us could cause increase to come into manifestation. I planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. Next verse, in case you doubt what I just said. So neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. I'm going to round up. I can't get to one tenth of the message for today. I will continue in future. I'm not going to do any overfeeding anymore. I want to stop here and show you something critical because if you miss this point, then you will continue in the vicious cycle of poverty for the rest of your life. It's not a curse. If you miss this next point, you will see that you will not have enough 
It's not because you're cursed, it's because you're walking contrary to the law of harvest. And you don't know its process and how it functions. So you can't save, you can't invest. And it continues. No matter what you earn, you'll not be able to save. And when you save anything, one trouble will hit it, bam, it will all go. It's called vicious cycle of poverty. We cannot invest because we cannot save, and we cannot save because we cannot invest. Okay? Let me read that to verse 9. So neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now, he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God, who, who are God's fellow workers? The apostolic force, the people who are planting, who are watering. We are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. God gave us the master plan, the blueprint, to begin to recraft destinies, to begin to shape lives, to begin to point in the right direction. We will plant, others will water. God gives the increase. Neither he will plant is anything, nor he will water us, but God will give the increase. But we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. So if you are God's field, how would you get increase? Okay? Shall I conclude in this note? On this note today? All right. There's a hidden truth here. It is very crucial you understand it so that you do not shoot yourself in the foot and sabotage your own financial increase. You are God's field. Let's go to Isaiah 55. You are what? Uh, the problem is when you do not know you are God's field, you will think you are laborer. You are co laborer. You are not there yet. You are still filled. You become co laborer when you have passed the test of being a fruitful field. Uh, Isaiah 55, verse 1 to 3. What is the title of Isaiah 55? An invitation to abundant life. How many people are ready to receive this invite today? Are you sure? <laughs> An invitation to abundant life. I can tell you up front. An invitation to abundant life. Listen to what God's word says. Verse 1 to 3. Oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you will have no money. Come, buy, and eat. Uh -uh. How can you do that? You got no money and you're going to buy? How would you buy? Because somebody else paid for it. He paid with his life. He's the Lord of the harvest. That's why you didn't bring anything to this world and you're taking nothing out of it. Do you understand me? Except what you do, what is given to you will be the deeds that follow you when you're no longer here. I hear a voice from heaven that says, Blessed are those who are dead in the Lord, for they cease from their labor and their deeds follow them. It's what you do with what is given to you here that will be deeds that will follow you or you return empty. Are you still here? Let me read Isaiah 55 again. Oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you will have no money. Come buy and eat. Yes, come buy what? Wine and milk without money and without price. Don't disqualify yourself. He's still raising the poor from the donkey and the beggar from the doors to set them among the princes because the pillars of the earth belong to the Lord and not to any person. Next verse. Why do you spend money for what is not bread? And your wages for what does not satisfy. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear 
and come to me. Here and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant, covenant in perpetuity, where there is no decrease, no diminishing returns, where you ever increase and never decrease, come into everlasting covenant with me, the sure mercies of David. You know what the sure mercies of David is? It's my pattern. I raised him from following the little ewes and sheep. I made him a king and I gave him a name renowned among the great men of the earth. And because he's del- he so delighted in abundance, he said, I'm living in a house of cedar. The ark of the covenant of God of Israel is dwelling me. I will build God a house. He had no dime. There was no money in his hand. His house was built by a foreign king for him. So how can I be living here and live that in that situation? And he, he said, I'll be God a house. And God said, no, no, don't build me a house. That was 2 Samuel chapter 7. You go to 2 Samuel chapter 8. He began to have conquest after conquest after conquest. After his soul, delighted in abundance. I know one of my people here who was in debt when we laid the foundation of the citadel. And who simply prayed a prayer. Lord, grant me grace to be able to at least fund 10%. At that time, it was $2 billion. Somebody that was in debt that could then rise to give a billion and more than that. And you will not notice it in his head. He will begin to walk like this and nobody can talk to him anymore. Ego, hoodie. I said to you, you have opportunity to rise as the building rises. Some have risen, some have remained in the same situation because of your heart attitude. Clinging to what cannot keep you can never be sufficient for you. Others are pouring themselves and say, oh, let, let, Let's be careful. And no pastor, don't. And no pastor, I don't go on here. Your own is bitter. <laughs> Thank you. Next verse. Indeed, I've given him as what? A witness, a pattern, a prototype to people that if you can follow what David did, you get the same result. But let's go to verse 10. You will understand why you are God's field now. Why you are God's field. Verse number 10. For as the rain comes down from where? As the rain comes down and the snow from heaven. And they not return there, but water the earth, the field. Water the earth and make it bring forth and bird that he may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. That when you are hearing word like this, your heart attitude can begin to knock it off. You understand me? So it cannot penetrate into your field and cause it to bird and bring forth. We are not supposed to be struggling. Is as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and waters the earth so that it brings forth and birth, so shall my word be when it's coming out of my servant's mouth because it's a co-laborer. We are laborers. You are filled. The word is coming like rain. It's coming upon your ground. It's coming upon your field to water it so that it can bring forth and birth. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So if the word penetrates your heart and takes root downwards and begins to produce upwards, see what will happen. Next verse. For you shall go out with joy. Amen. You'll be led out with peace. Amen. The mountains and the hills, every stumbling block in your way, shall break forth into singing before you. Amen. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn, pay attention. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress tree. And instead of the briar, this is the ground that was cursed before in the days of Adam because it burned with the whole thing. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress tree. And instead of the bitter, briar shall come up the mighty tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name for an everlasting shine that shall not be cut off. Ask anybody in my family, in my neighborhood, where I grew up, and all my mates, that, that 
knew me, they knew this is not the work of any man. Yes. My family knows this is God. Do you understand me? They know that there's nothing you can do about this. I told you the story of my uncle that came to Lagos to see my older brother when I stepped into politics in 2011. <sighs> my uncle said, I'm scared. This is the star of our family now. We don't want him killed. You know what they did to Abiola, what they did to this, what they did to that, or not Gurua and that, this and that. Please, why don't you talk to your brother? He said, no. My uncle, don't worry. I, I believe with my brother enough to know that he's not holding on to God. Uncle said, ha, does he have other powers? He said, my brother is not holding on to God. It's God who is holding him. God is the one holding him. They can't kill him. Don't worry yourself. I'm still here. I'm a sign and a wonder to my family, to my people. And you will be one also. But what kind of ground are you? Are you producing thorns? You are God's field. We are fellow laborers. Let's go into the New Testament and see what he's saying. You are God's field. The word that we preach is God's reign. And as you are watered, you are supposed to bring forth and bud like the earth, so as to give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Hebrews 6, 7 and 8. For the earth which drinks in the rain, hello, you are the field. For the earth which drinks in the rain, every Sunday, every Wednesday, every time we have opportunity to gather together, you are drinking the rain, the word, the word that is coming to, for the earth which drinks in the rain, that often comes upon it and bears herbs, useful for those by whom it is cultivated. <laughs> That's a critical thing. You can despise your pastor in your heart and get to the point that you say, look, I think I'm stopping here. I've done enough. Let others do. It happened to me. I began to say, huh. I started dealing with man instead of dealing with God paid a high price for it that I will never do it again because it is a fellow laborer that cultivates the soil. Now read. For the earth we drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and prayers, it is rejected and near to being cursed. Whose hand is to be born? That's how people crash from top to bottom. They despise the one who is telling them the truth. They just feel their money is everything. How dare you talk to me like that? <laughs> then the rain stops. Then the ground is no longer cultivated either by God or by his servants, and he will produce thorns and briars. Second Corinthians 9, 6 to 11. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 11. But this I say he will sow sparingly. We also reap. What does it mean to sow sparingly? You say little, it's not little, because that widow woman gave only two pence, and she said he gave more than all. It's to spare the fat for yourself and give the lean to God. Go read Malachi. You keep the best for yourself and leave the rest for the Lord of harvest. Yeah. He will sow sparingly, shall reap sparingly, and he will sow bountifully, shall also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart. So when you are given, God is not looking at the amount you have, he's looking at your heart. Yes, Whether you are bringing honor to him or dishonor. Yes, not grudgingly of necessity when you begin to do it. A lay, a unfair garage you. <laughs> For God loves a cheerful giver. 
And I taught you before, you never become a cheerful giver until you are first and foremost a cheerful giver. For it is those who sow the tears that will reap with joy. And the and joyful giving would take place because you have given God that which cost you something, not pittance. You're not tipping God. Let's go on. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always having what? All sufficiency in what? In all things may what? May have, and I like the word may. Not automatic. May have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supply seed to the sower. And bread to the eater is what it says in King James Version. May he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown, not the one you have eaten, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Do you understand me? <laughs> May he multiply and increase the seed you have sown. Increase the fruits of your righteousness so that you have perpetual right standing with him. I can continue forever. On this course, two important lessons. Number one, you must constantly give God opportunity to increase you. Every time. Don't be weary in well doing. Constantly give God opportunity to increase you so that you don't decrease. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 1 to 6. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, 1 to 6. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a seven to seven, and also to eight, for you do not know what evil will be on the earth. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. Can you imagine? It's when they are full that they empty themselves upon the earth. But when you are full, you try to contain it. The clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. If a tree falls to the south or the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it shall lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. As you do not know what is the way of the wind, or how the bones grow in the womb of how is with child, so you do not know the works of God who makes everything. In the morning, sow your seed. In the evening, do not with all your hand. At the beginning of a project, sow your seed. When it's coming to an end, don't say, I've done enough. Ah, uh -uh, that's the evening of that project. Do not with all your hand. For you do not know which will prosper. Either what you gave before or what you are given now. Either this or that or whether both alike will be good. Lesson number two. The lesson to learn from all days is that the harvest is not yours and you cannot dispense your increase the way you choose. Let God lead you even in your investments. You cannot dispense your increase the way you choose. Let God lead you even in your investments. God gives power to get wealth in order to establish his covenant not just to satisfy your material acquisition. He wants you to have things, but he will not tolerate things having you. He's a jealous God. He will be checking your heart from time to time to see whether gold has become your God. The encounter between the rich young ruler and the Lord of the harvest proved this. One thing you lack. Go sell what you have, carry your cross and follow me. And he went away miserably because Jesus touched the raw man. That he was no longer having things, things already possessed him. I think I will stop here because the rest would take another two or three hours to finish. He is the Lord of the harvest, not you. Do you understand me? Be careful what you do with your harvest. Let me give you a tip to let you know that you can attract curse to yourself by what, and to your descendants by what you do with your harvest. Did God not bless Noah? Did God not multiply him? Did he not increase? Then Noah began to plant a vineyard. 
And the harvest of his vineyard got him drunk. He became naked. What happened? The curse that God lifted off the ground landed on his grandson for 350 years. Be careful what you do with your harvest. Stand to your feet. Lord, I bless your holy name this morning for the engrafted word and the word of power you have put in my heart and my mouth for my generation. I pray that everyone hearing me will line up, will understand that you are the Lord of the harvest. You want to increase us. You want to bless us in perpetuity. But those you cannot trust to remain stewards and treasurers to you, you stop your reign over them. This is how people become ex-millionaires. They used to have, that will be their new nomenclature. Deliver my people from search. Amen. Restore the years that the locusts have eaten. Amen. Bring them back to the place of genuine repentance. Amen. So that they can truly repent and know that you freely give us things to enjoy, but you do not want anything to replace you in our lives. We say forever, O oh Lord, that gold will not replace God in our lives. We will not trade you for gold. We will not trade you for silver. And you will remain the Lord of our harvest, the Lord of our increase. And every investment we do will be because you are leading us into it. Flesh will not lead us to a material mesmerism will not derail us. Receive all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' mighty name, and the people said, Amen. Amen. Stretch your hands towards me and pray. I refuse to take offering at the end so that you will not think it's about your offering. <laughs> Stretch your hand and pray. Pray to the Father that having been a blessing to you, I will not attract curse to my soul. That having preached to others, I might not become a castaway. As I pray for you that you have hearing ears, understanding heart. And you humble yourself before mighty hand of God so that in due season it will exalt you and bring you to that place of over and above where you move from sufficiency to have all things that you can use to bless other people and to extend the frontiers of his kingdom on the face of the earth. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. And the people said, Amen. Amen. Tell your neighbor, be careful. What you, do what you do with your harvest. With your harvest. Be, very, very Be very, very careful what you do, what you do with, your with your harvest. I want you to imagine a square. You know what a square is? It's a box. In that box, I want you to draw a cross in your mind. Can you see? Yes, How many pigeon holes would you have there? Four. Four. The first one you can call one, the second one you can call two, the third one you can call three, the fourth one you can call four. The first one are the haves, the second one are the have-nots, the third one are the yet to have, the fourth one are the used to have. I've been in all the boxes. There's no box I've not been, so that's why I'm careful. I know who owns the thing he has given me. I'm a steward, not owner. For as long as I remain in covenant with him, I will lack no good thing. It does not matter how big the project is. Resources will come from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south. Nothing will fail. That will be your portion. I love you.